Welcome back to the Whole Council Devotional. Today we continue with the story of the creation in Genesis chapter 1. Let's jump right in beginning with verse 3. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. And here, three verses into the Bible, we already see the amazing power of God. He didn't have to work to fashion or form light. He simply spoke, and it came to be, just as we see in Ezekiel 12, 25. God says, For I am the Lord, I speak, and the word which I speak will come to pass. The God we serve is all-powerful, and can simply speak things into existence. Here we are in day one of creation, and God calls light into being. Yet there are no sun, no moon, no stars. God doesn't create those until day four. Now before we go further, let's address a couple of points about the time frame of creation. Genesis 1 tells us that there are seven days of creation, six where God did something, and one more where God rested. Let's look at the interesting way that the Bible phrases the time frame of creation in verse 5. It says, So the evening and the morning were the first day, or day one. The way this is written is the reason that Jews throughout history have recognized the beginning of a new day at sunset and not at midnight. The people were in a hurry to take the body of Jesus off the cross before it got dark, because the next day was a holy day and was set to begin at dusk. However, the Hebrew words for evening and morning, Erev and Boker, don't have their origins in a time of day. Erev is a time of mixing, a time of disorder, the way that things become difficult to distinguish as the darkness of night approaches. In the same way, Boker is the ability to inspect or investigate as the light of dawn slowly reveals to us what was impossible to see during the night. Looking at verse 5 once again, the Hebrew could actually read, So disorder became order on day one. God took an earth without form and void and began to bring order out of the chaos. Now when faced with the claims of modern science, many Christians advocate theistic evolution. That is, that God created everything by setting evolution in motion. They often advocate an age theory, for each of the days, pointing out that the Hebrew word for day, yom, does not specifically refer to a 24-hour period and can also mean some indeterminate period of time. The problem is, I believe this is directly contrary to what the Bible says. In Exodus 20, God gives the Ten Commandments to the Israelites in the wilderness. Beginning in verse 80 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who was within your gates. Now here's the key part. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. God, in His infinite wisdom, has foreseen these arguments and specifically addresses them in a passage that, to us, seems totally unrelated. While the Hebrew word for day is still the word yom, as it is everywhere in the Old Testament, God clearly connects the six days of work before the Sabbath with His six days of creation before He rested. This is the beauty of the Bible. While it looks to us like 66 different books, which man is further divided into chapters and verses, it's actually one book with one author, the Holy Spirit. It's not simply a book with over 31,000 verses, but as one Bible teacher likes to say, it's an integrated message system. So what do we do with a science which speaks of such long times versus a Bible that claims a six-day creation? and gives a history of man of only about 6,000 years. 
Hasn't science been able to prove that the universe is billions of years old? The simplest answer to that question is that, no, science has not proven any such thing, and there are a number of possible explanations for the discrepancies between what scientists advocate and what the Bible states. There are a huge number of indications of a young earth. The salinity of the oceans, the magnetic field of the earth, the pressure of oil, the sediment of the Mississippi River Delta, the erosion of Niagara Falls, the amount of helium in minerals, the quantity of micrometeoroids in space, the amount of carbon-14 in deep geological strata, and many other things all suggest a young Earth on the order of thousands, not millions or billions of years. An examination of strata near the Grand Canyon shows large fossils of squid-like animals in thick layers which must have been laid down in a very short period of time. The eruptions of Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980 created a miniature Grand Canyon in a period of weeks, complete with standing petrified trees. If a volcanic eruption can cause that, what might the entrance of sin and a global flood have done to change the Earth to what it is today? The simple answer is that we can't know all of the answers. And that's not only okay, that's healthy. 1 Corinthians 13 says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. For now, we know in part. But someday, when we are present with God, we will no longer have that handicap. Until then, we must trust in Him, and trust that, despite the fact that we don't have all the answers, His word is true. Returning to Genesis, we see that verse 3 is the first recorded statement of God. Let there be light. Now when it comes to God in the Bible, I'm the type of guy who looks for the extraordinary in the seemingly ordinary. As we read a couple of days ago, the Bible is about Jesus. And who is Jesus? Well, his Hebrew name, Yeshua or Yehoshua, means Yahweh or Jehovah is salvation. Jesus' very name tells us that He, that God, is our salvation. So the Bible is a book about how Yahweh is salvation. Going back to Genesis chapter 1, God's first declaration is about light. And I love that because here, three verses into the Bible, we've already encountered two allusions to our salvation. You might be wondering how we've already seen two allusions to salvation when we haven't even mentioned one yet. Well, the first allusion I recognize is in verse 2. It tells us that while the earth was without form and void, and while darkness was upon it, the Spirit of God was present. In the darkness and vanity of our lives, God's Spirit hovered over us. His presence was around about us, waiting for the opportunity for His light to break through and shine upon us. And now, in verse 3, God brings forth the light in that darkness. In Luke 2, at Jesus' dedication, Simeon says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. John also talks about Jesus as a light in chapter 1 of his gospel, writing, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. John 1.5 is perhaps even better translated from the Greek as it's written in the Lexham English Bible, and the darkness did not overcome it. When you allow the light of Christ to shine in the darkness and emptiness of your life, you're transformed, and the darkness can't overcome His light in you. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow.